Welcome to this short video on random walks. So first, what is a random walk? A random walk is sometimes called a drunkard's walk. And you can imagine a person who's had too much to drink starts here at the center of the plot at the bar and then takes a step out of the bar in some random direction for some length. But then that person loses their balance and takes another step in a new random direction and maybe walks that maybe back towards the bar, maybe it's farther away. And then yet again, they have to take another step in another new random direction. and Maybe that's back out this way again. And you can imagine that this drunkard wanders vaguely around in some field, sometimes getting farther away from where they started and sometimes coming back closer. And this random walk or drunkard's walk is in contrast to our usual understanding of a random process where your position say in x and y coordinates is drawn randomly with a mean in this case the mean being zero and a displacement from that mean in a random direction so in contrast to this random distribution of points around some mean with a standard deviation of sigma, a random walk chains random events together. You step from one position to another with a displacement that is drawn from a random distribution. So if we call random numbers phi, then we could have a, a set or vector of random numbers, which is just a first random number followed by a second random number, and so on. It's this whole series of random variables. Then a random distribution is just the collection of these random variables phi. But a random walk is the sum of these random variables. So if w describes our random walk, each w consists of a bunch of positions, w0, w1, and so on, where each wi is the sum of j equals 0 to i of phi j, which is to say w is the cumulative sum over a random variable. Now why do we care about random walks? Well, it turns out they show up in a lot of different cases. So what are some examples of random walks? Well, games played in a series is an example of a random walk. You could imagine that you have team one playing baseball against team two. If team one tends to win about 60% of the time, you might expect that team to win in a series, but not always. And in fact, if you played seven games, you might find that team one won and then maybe team one won again, and then maybe team two won, and then maybe team one won again, and then team two, then team two, and then team one. And you want to know who wins the series. Well, that winning the series is a cumulative sum over these states, each of which was a random draw out of a distribution of outcomes determined by the relative probabilities of these two teams winning. Notice just because this variable phi is a random variable doesn't necessarily have to mean that it's a fair variable. It could be biased. It could have a skewed probability. A lot of physical systems are also random walks. For example, diffusion can be thought of as a random walk of different particles that are mixing with one another. For example, you could start with a box with one kind of particle on one side and another kind of particle on another side. And each of these particles, because of random molecular motion, starts bouncing around through the box, colliding with other particles and colliding with the box. And eventually you get that these two particles mix together. So diffusion is a random walk. Scattering can also be thought of as a random walk. For example, you might remember the game Plinko from The Price is Right, which had a grid of pegs that a contestant slid a disc down through. And as it passes between the pegs, it randomly bounces to one side or another through here, taking some random path through this pegboard and scattering or bouncing off of each of the pegs along the way. And the reason why the contestant doesn't always just win if they're trying to make their disc fall in a particular box where they can win a prize is because of the random walk that that disc is taking through this pegboard. And a final example of an area where you might find random walks is in statistics, specifically statistical model fitting. So often when you're trying to fit a model to some data, you'll have a concept of a fitness function where good fits of your model to your data leave low residuals like this or this, and bad fits of your model to your data give you higher answers like this. And you can evaluate your models with respect to a parameter. So in this case, the horizontal axis represents different values of a parameter. And in general, you can have lots and lots and lots of parameters, so you end up in a multi-dimensional space, and you're trying to figure out your fitness function in this multi-dimensional space. And it turns out for a wide range of problems, you can't actually evaluate your fitness at all the different combinations of parameters that you might like to. So what people often do instead is a thing called a Markov chain Monte Carlo, which is sometimes abbreviated MCMC. And Markov chain is just a fancy word for random variable. And Monte Carlo means game of chance. 
And so what you typically do in a Markov chain Monte Carlo system for fitting a model is you start your parameter at some random point, say here, and you evaluate the fitness there. And then you take a random step away from that, maybe say over to here. And then if your fitness improved, you make that jump and you move down to there. And then you take another random jump from that new point. And if your random jump is worse than the point that you're at, then sometimes you jump there and sometimes you don't. And whether or not you do is a random choice based on the relative values of the, of the fitness. But because you always take jumps that improve your fitness, you'll find that you eventually dive down into these minima. And because it's hard to jump out of these minima, because your fitness is always getting worse, you end up spending a lot of time bouncing around back and forth inside your minimum. But eventually you do jump out, and maybe you jump over into another minimum and spend a little time there, and then maybe you jump out and spend some more time in another minimum over here. But because this minimum is even deeper, it's even harder to climb out of, so you might spend a little time over here, but you never get quite out. And then if you ended up plotting how often you spent in all these different parameter positions, you might find that you spent a little bit of time here, a little bit of time here, quite a lot of time here, a little bit over here, not much here. And what you've done by using this Markov chain is you've efficiently explored your parameter space to find areas where your model is likely to be correct. And you spent a lot of time mapping that out and spent relatively little time in areas where your model is unlikely to be correct. So this is using a random process in a random walk to walk through parameter space efficiently. So hopefully I've convinced you that random walks are important. So now let's talk about a couple important properties of random walks. One important property is that if the average value of phi, that random variable, so the average value of phi is zero, which means that you're just as likely to take a step in any direction as in the opposite of that direction, then if I look at my walk at some point i, and I compare that to where it was at some previous point, let's say j, so this is a previous location, and this could have been a long time ago, j doesn't have to be close to i, and I ask how far apart are these likely to be, that distance will be proportional to the square root of i minus j. Another way of saying this is that the sum of n random numbers with zero mean is proportional to the square root of n. And it turns out this is a very important property. And it's something fundamental about random variables, which is that they add in quadrature. Quadrature means that if I have variable one and I'm adding another random variable two, that the square of that amplitude will tend to be equal to, when you average it, the amplitude of the first number squared plus the amplitude of the second number squared. Now this is drastically different than non-random variables. For example, if I add steps of 1, then 1 plus 1 squared is going to be 2 squared, which is 4, which is not equal to 1 squared, which is 1, plus 1 squared, right? So this is not true for steps that are coherently pointed in one direction. The fact that they add in quadrature means that generally, because these two steps are uncorrelated with e each other, when you take one random step in one direction, and then add it to another random step in another direction, the fact that they're uncorrelated, meaning that phi1 times phi2, possibly conjugate if it's a complex number, averaged is zero, means that on average, phi2 points in a different direction orthogonal to phi1. And then we know by the Pythagorean theorem that the magnitude of their sum should be the sum of the squares of their sides. So they add in quadrature, according to the Pythagorean theorem, because they are uncorrelated. Another way of seeing that is just to actually create the square of this number, phi1 plus phi2 squared, which is equal to phi1 squared plus 2 phi1 phi2 plus phi2 squared. And this is precisely where random variables are different. For normal variables, this cross term is not equal to zero, but for random uncorrelated numbers, this cross term averages out to zero precisely because that's what uncorrelated means, which is why random variables add in quadrature. So if you're trying to measure a quantity, suppose I was trying to measure a quantity p and I get some random noise added onto it. If I make a lot of measurements of this quantity p, each with different noises, the fact that I can add all of those measurements up 
divide by the number of measurements I made to average them and get a good estimate of p is precisely because all of these terms here add in quadrature. So when I add up all my p's, all my measurements of p, I get n times p. And when I add up all the noise measurements I made, I get only the square root n times the typical magnitude of phi. So then when I divide out by n, what I get is p plus a noise term that is 1 over the square root of n times the average magnitude of my noise. So my noise beats down according to root n, the square root of the number of measurements I made. So the fact that random variables add in quadrature is precisely why I can average noisy measurements together to get better estimates of my quantity that I'm trying to measure. And this is a general property of random walks, which is that their displacement from the center is proportional to the square root of the number of steps that you've taken. So a consequence of this is, for example, that diffusion times are proportional to distance squared. Because if you take one random step per unit time, and you need to go a certain distance or displacement from where you started, you'll need to take n squared steps to make up that distance. So another interesting property of random walks is that even though the sum of a bunch of random numbers grows as the square root of n and doesn't depend on the number of dimensions, you can take a random walk in one dimension and just walk back and forth on a number line here, bouncing back and forth. Or you could take a random walk in two dimensions, or in three dimensions, or even higher. And the fact that your displacement from your starting point grows as the square root of n does not depend on dimensionality. However, the time scale for reaching a certain displacement does. And why is this? It's because as you are exploring more and more dimensions, there's more and more volume for you to explore, which means that even though your initial step may be in one direction, the more dimensions you have, the more steps there are that are in a completely different direction from the direction you're going. Another way of saying this is that the projection of a random step phi along any axis decreases. Right? So if you're taking a random walk and you need to get a certain distance along the x-axis, for example, the fact that you're in a multi-dimensional space means that you're going to get there more slowly. So along any specific direction, your time scale for diffusion to get there in a random walk goes up, even though your actual displacement from the center in this multi-dimensional space does not depend on dimensionality. So these are probably the two most important properties of random walks. The fact that they grow as root n, and the fact that the efficiency with which you explore a space goes down with dimensionality. So if you keep these things in mind, you'll discover that random walks are very useful tools for understanding a wide range of situations, ranging from diffusion and scattering to model fitting and even to sports. And particularly if you're using random walks to evaluate models statistically, you might want to consider that if you have a two-dimensional space of parameters that you're trying to explore, and your likely parameters follow contours that are some combination of x and y, which is to say that your distributions are one-dimensional inside of a two-dimensional space, that there can be a huge advantage to reducing the dimensionality of the space that you're fitting. And that's all I have to say about random walks.